The House will now have under consideration House Bill Number 226. Good gentleman from District 4. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I request unanimous consent to dispense with further reading of House Bill 226. Without objection. The gentleman has the floor to open the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good ladies and gentlemen. Uh, House Bill 226 is the fiscal year 2021 uh, supplemental appropriation for the Office of the State Board of Education in the amount of $5,980,500 uh, for an early childhood education development grant. Uh, first off, I think it's really important to note uh, that this is neither uh, COVID-related dollars or a part of Building Idaho's future program. So I think this might be the first of the year that uh, doesn't have either of those connected to it. Uh, first off, what to, uh, to point out, uh, this grant was actually awarded on January 1st, 2021 by the Trump administration. Um, and the Office of the State Board of Education has identified uh, the Idaho Association for the Education of Young, young Children uh, to administer this grant. They're a 501c3 here in the state of Idaho. Uh, the goal of this grant is to uh, provide education resources for parents and children ages birth through five uh, and support locally controlled, high quality, family focused programs that support optimal growth and development of young children. I think it's really important to understand part of the timeline associated with this grant. This is actually a renewal of a grant uh, that Idaho uh, is currently operating under. Uh, go back a couple years, uh, 2019, uh, there were a group of uh, legislators, both from uh, the House and the Senate, that attended a, a conference in uh, New Orleans in the summer of 2019. I could think of other places to go in the summer than New Orleans, but that was where the conference was at. Uh, this uh, included uh, the good lady from 33 and the good gentleman from 24. Uh, they, they attended a conference uh, for the Wolf Institute, which deals with education policy and research. And out of that conference, there was a brainstorming and, and a discussion on how to, how to move forward with uh, early childhood education issues in Idaho. And one of the things that came out of that was a, an idea to put together essentially a needs assessment for the state. Uh, rather than saying, we have a plan and we know how to fix it, uh, we, we need to get this plan together and understand you know, what actually is happening in Idaho uh, related to early childhood education. And from that, uh, the group uh, petitioned uh, Governor Little, or excuse me, the uh, gentleman on the second floor, uh, to look into the possibility of uh, grant funding to, to conduct essentially that needs analysis and, and uh, figuring out uh, kind of the basics of, of early, ha early childhood education in Idaho. And uh, they were able to uh, apply for a grant, and the grant actually uh, pretty much uh, exactly mirrored what uh, uh, that group of legislators uh, were looking to do, and they were awarded that grant um, in the fall of 2019, I believe. Uh, since then, uh, the Idaho Association for the Education of Young Children, uh, the group that I mentioned uh, prior, and the Office of the State Board of Education have been conducting that needs analysis and have been working throughout the state in building uh, what we call, or what they call, local education collaboratives. Uh, and I'll get into those in a little bit. Uh, but this is not a new concept. Uh, this. Uh, uh, early childhood education grant already exists in Idaho. Uh, we've been working on this for a year now. Uh, this is a, a renewal of the grant uh, for three more years uh, to continue and, and uh, build out and flesh out and help uh, young children here in Idaho. Uh, some of the original goals of the grant, just to be clear, uh, like I said, a completion of a statewide early childhood needs assessment, uh, develop of a strategic plan for strengthening collaboration, coordination, and quality improvement, uh, maximizing parental choice and engagement, uh, sharing best practices among early childhood care and education providers to prepare uh, for kindergarten readiness, and improving the overall quality of the state's early care and education programs. So now moving forward, what do we have uh, before us today in the uh, $5.98 million grant that we're uh, looking to, to administer in the state? Uh, this, uh, first off, when you, when you see it, the title is uh, Preschool Development Grant, which is very actually misleading. Uh, and part of that is a change in policy uh, during the Trump administration. Uh, while the name of the uh, grant has stayed the same, uh, the focus uh, in charge of the grant has changed considerably under the, the Trump administration. Uh, 
moving away from trying to essentially establish child care uh, facilities to essentially maximizing those opportunities that we currently have in the state. And so uh, a little bit different of a focus, even though it has a, uh, the same title. Uh, current goals of the grant program uh, include maximizing parental knowledge, choice and engagement, uh, building local collaborative networks, uh, providing what we call the Early Learning Institute, which is about educational awareness opportunities, and building quality initiatives for home-based and center-based child care programs. I did mention that uh, one of the parts, big parts of this uh, program is related to uh, the local collaborative networks. Uh, many of you may be familiar with these because they are housed in every part of our state and they're comprised of um, working with local nonprofits, businesses, uh, families, some legislators are involved I know locally in, in different ones. But if you're curious as to where these already exist, uh, American Falls, Basin, Coeur d'Alene, Fremont, Garden City, Kendrick, Julieta, Magic Valley, Marsing, Murtaugh, Nampa, Notice, Parma, Pocatello, Chubbuck, Sandpoint, and Valley County. Uh, so as you can see, these are, these are pretty widespread across the state to work with uh, local partners and, and essentially assessing, first off, what are the local needs? Because local needs for child care issues and, and early childhood ed issues are, are very different depending on where you live. Obviously, it's a different uh, world around uh, uh, early childhood education and child care here in Boise than it would be uh, if you're in a very rural part of our state. And so this grant uh, is really focused on meeting all of those local needs. And so that's why the collaborative networks are so important is to help understand the needs of those local communities. Uh, right now, if uh, a study was conducted and essentially uh, they said that 50 percent of Idaho is is in a uh, health, uh, education early childhood education uh, desert so uh, people just don't have access to uh, to child care in all parts of the state and that's why this is really important because um, a lot of the times those those are going to fall upon uh, individual homes or uh, small networks of families uh, in rural uh, uh, parts of Idaho and this is to help provide uh, resources resources to those uh, small communities, uh, helps parents, helps uh, children. Obviously, uh, I think we all uh, want our, our youngest children to, to have the greatest start to life and, and to uh, be ready for kindergarten when we get there. Because obviously we know uh, if they're not ready to, to be successful in kindergarten when they arrive, uh, their hill is a much more uh, difficult and steep one to climb. Uh, I did uh, have a handout passed out to you uh, from uh, Senators Risch and Crapo, and this was actually an interview that was conducted uh, from them, and there's just some quotes that are identified in there, and I think you can find that they're uh, pretty excited about uh, the opportunity for uh, Idaho to have this grant, and I think they would uh, encourage you to, to uh, consider uh, the important needs that this will uh, um, provide to to uh, children here in Idaho and families here in Idaho. I know there's been, and, and I, I, I don't think we should avoid it, there's been uh, concerns expressed obviously on uh, some of the, the issues behind uh, this bill, and, and I, I will try to as, mass, as best as I can to address those. I know there's uh, one of your handouts identifies a, a, a law firm in Idaho that uh, is identified on uh, the Idaho Association of Education's website. Uh, I will point out that program, uh, Step, for, Step Up for Idaho, uh, where they're highlighted under, is essentially a program that identifies uh, businesses and individuals and organizations uh, that are that are promoting uh, family-friendly workplaces or uh, early childhood education-related things. Um, obviously, there was some concern that uh, somehow this might be funneling money one way or the other. Uh, none, of, none of this money is going to uh, any of those uh, individuals or businesses that are identified um, in the Step Up for Idaho program. Uh, even so, I, we recognized, uh, I, I think the Idaho Association for the Education of Young Children uh, realized that maybe, you know, uh, anything that could be perceived as a conflict of interest was, was not their intention. The entire uh, belief behind the grant is to help children not to try to create controversy. So I know they took down uh, that particular business from their website so that it, it didn't perceive anything in a, as far as a conflict of interest. 
I know there's a, a couple other handouts that highlight uh, several programs uh, in, in uh, issues that are mostly uh, uh, conducted by the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Uh, you'll see some websites, I think, on there, on one of the handouts that's identified uh, that highlights some programs from, from the national organization. Uh, just so you have a better understanding, uh, the National Association for the Education of Young Children and the Idaho Association for the Education of Young Children sound very, very similar, uh, but they are completely separate organizations. Uh, they're separate 501c3. There's no money that transfers between those two institutions. Uh, the programming and curriculum are not uh, universal, so uh, the Idaho Association of Education of Young Children uh, is completely in charge. They have their own uh, separate board of directors, uh, and so we do it the Idaho way here. Um, and, and their goal is to try to help uh, children and families in Idaho uh, prepare their kids for, uh, for kindergarten. And uh, I think this is an opportunity uh, for Idaho to continue to work uh, towards uh, preparing uh, our children for the best possible future that they can have. Uh, I think this is a, a small step in the right direction. Um, I'm glad that uh, Idaho was able to apply for this grant in the past and now be awarded a renewal by the Trump administration. Um, and I hope that you can support this bill and happy to answer questions, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Is there further debate? A uh, good lady from District 7. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the good gentleman yield to a question? Will the gentleman yield to a question? Gentleman yields, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman yields. Gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good gentlemen, in the bill language, it says that the goal would be to provide education resources for these preschoolers. Can you um, explain, or maybe you know, who will control the, the content of those education resources that are provided to the preschoolers? Down from four. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, and good lady. Uh, just not to preschoolers, so this, this grant does include uh, essentially birth through uh, uh, entry into to kindergarten. Um, the resources are developed essentially through the Idaho Association for the Education of Young Children uh, in collaboration with the Office of the State Board of Education. I'll from seven. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the good gentleman yield to a follow-up? Well, the gentleman yield. The gentleman yield. The gentleman yield. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good gentleman. Are you aware of if this nonprofit has provided any support or if they would encourage or support the teaching of the Pledge of Allegiance to these young kids? Gentleman from four. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and, and good lady. I, I do not know the answer to that question. I was not something that I, I asked of them, but I'm happy to get that for you. Is there further debate? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, to debate against the bill. Thank you, good speaker. You know, I don't sit in the education committee, and so I really don't understand a lot of what is going on in our education system. But as many of you know, I have a one and a half year old and a two and a half year old. And so now, as the good speaker, usually says, I've got skin in the game. <laughs> when we look at the content that is going to be provided to these little youngsters, you know, in this political battle that we're in, it's really, it's a worldwide battle. It is so imperative that we fight for the hearts and minds of these little ones. And that's why this caught my attention. So I was sitting in JFAC committee and just showed up, you know, an, an early eight o'clock and I was unaware of this grant at all. And I did a quick reading and I saw that it gives close to six million dollars to a nonprofit. So that's the first thing that caught my eye because we don't usually see a direct, um, a, you know, a bill for one amount of money going to a nonprofit. That, that's not a common tendency. I know I had tried to get money for another nonprofit and there was a lot of, eh, we don't, we try not to do that. Um, and, and I think that's that we go into that cautiously for a good reason, because 
When it comes to nonprofits, you can't go to the Transparent Idaho website and look and see what they're spending that grant money on. Nonprofits, they don't have to reveal all of that. So once the money goes, while um, you know some of the state agencies can ask about it, there really is no requirement for them to provide an accounting of how this money is spent. And so it did cause me to ask the question, and I did a quick internet search while the executive director was talking about the grant. And I instantly, when I pulled up the website, I, I saw on their um, page just just showcasing uh, an Idaho business, which you know really isn't uh, isn't alarming, but showcasing the business of an individual running for office, it just initially I thought, ooh, is there maybe a conflict of interest here? And so I did ask the question, and and it was answered that no, they're not receiving any money, even though they are being showcased, kind of advertising, but it, that that. That's okay. So, so that's all right. We we move on, right? Um, but I, I did want people to be aware of how I saw that potential conflict of interest. But then I kept digging because you know I've got skin in the game when it comes to really even on the, um, their their social media website. There's multiple instances where this is discussed as a preschool grant. And so I do find that interesting that there is a, a growing nationwide push to get mandatory preschool uh, into all states, really. And I do think that that is a valuable policy decision that we could discuss. But I don't think that just allowing federal money to come in to push preschool is a very wise choice. And the reason I don't think it's wise is because we then lose our ability to control the content. And so I kept digging. When you go to the IAEYC website, at the very top, there is a membership button. And when you click on that membership button, because you, they want you to be a member to get these resources, you can't just become a member of the IDAEYC. There is only the option for the membership to the national organization because they are an affiliate group. And so I think that's uh, important as we try to distinguish whether or not this is an Idaho nonprofit or if this is a national nonprofit that is slowly moving into our state to push preschool. So please keep that in mind and go check out their website if you'd like to become a member. So the next thing I started digging was where I started looking at their content and what resources are available. What, what are the resources that we're providing to these parents? Just like in the bill says, we're gonna provide education resources. So what are those resources? So, um, and actually, let's back up um, to the, the national, when you look on their national website that we're an affiliate and if you want to become a member, you have to become a member there. On the, the second page of your handout at the bottom, you'll notice they put out catalogs. So when you get a membership, you get one of their um, catalogs. And this last catalog, some of the title topics are, you know, the, the power and knowledge to transform our teaching and our learning. But the, the ones that kind of concern me now is this knowledge-rich curriculum supporting positive identity development and advancing equity. Well, that, that sounds good. I, I'd like to uh, advance equality. And that it's never too young to support a cause. And how supporting positive identity development through social justice curriculum in preschool. And that's where my skin in the game kind of ruffled the feathers on the back of my neck. Why are we providing preschoolers, little developing children, information on how to help them with social justice curriculum? 
So that brings up a huge issue. I think we need to talk about social justice ideology. That's what you're voting for. You're voting for social justice ideology to be given through grant money to our little ones. So when you look at the next page, where on the national website, they show you what they support. They have a position statement on what it means, advancing equity. And you can see on page 14, their position statement, who we are an affiliate with, says whiteness confers privilege, as does being a male. I'll tell you, it's an honor for me to serve with every one of you. And I do not believe that you are privileged based on your gender or your race. I absolutely believe in our constitutional and freedoms and that we are all created equal. So let's go to page 18 of their position statement where it talks about our structural inequities or what white fragility is that you what is it? <laughs> you, can, you can read it. Or let's talk about intersexuality. And, and why are we teaching that to a two-year-old? Because I will tell you that my two-and-a-half-year-old, she knows half of the Pledge of Allegiance. And she is proud of it. So you say, okay, that's the national group. Even though we're an affiliate, and even though you have to get a membership with them, we're not teaching that in Idaho. Okay, let's go to the next page. You can see the website at the top, idahoaeyc.org, and at the bottom, self-regulation, a foundation for our leadership and educational success workshop resources. Here are those resources that are in the bill. This is great. Let's click on the link to classroom literature. And then you can see the little printout there underneath it. The very first thing that pops up when you click on those resources, first of all, it's a whole book list. But I'll just start with the number one book on their book list. Is A is for activism. It's an ABC board book written and illustrated for the next generation of progressives, families who want their kids to grow up in a space that's unapologetic for activism, environmental justice, civil rights, LGBTQ rights, they forgot the plus, I think, and everything else that activists believe in and fight for. So, hey, it's on our Idaho website. Let's look through the rest of the book list. A picture book that invites white children and parents to become curious about racism and accept that it's real and cultivate justice. How about being misgendered? 10,000 dresses for Marcus Ewart. How about Lila's lunchbox? A Ramadan story. That's awesome, but I don't see a story in here about Christianity. In a new school, um, And then there's your A for activism. And then the famous white fragility, why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. So what is social justice and why are we teaching it to our children? And what is critical race theory and why are we teaching it to our children? You know, social justice a year ago, I, I wouldn't have known really how to define it. No, I, I want justice in our society. That's why we're all here. We want justice. But social justice ideology is not about providing justice. It's divisive in its very nature. It creates two groups of people. You have aggrieved minorities and you have oppressive mi majorities. And it compromises the dreams of assimilating diverse people into our great American melting pot. 
and thus it hurts the free exchange of ideas. It festers anger and resentment while undermining mutual respect. This is the content that we're providing. So let's talk about critical race theory. You know, it's actually, it's also an ideology. If you do a quick internet search, it talks about it's a framework in jurisprudence that examines society and culture as related to race and law and power in the United States. You know, critical race theory teaches racism is present in every aspect of your life, in every relationship and in every interaction. It's against free society and your independent nature. It teaches that anyone who disagrees with it must do so for a racist reason. You know, this theory is not an effective way for us to deal with race issues. And I think we have to do everything that we can to get this out of our education system. We have to get these resources away from our little kids. I mean, that's how we're losing the hearts and minds of our little ones. And so I think I will end and summarize it in that if we want preschool in our state, let's address that policy and let's move forward. But let's not just usher in federal money that we have no control over the content. So let, there are other organizations that can do this. And please, let's not indoctrinate our kids. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Is there further debate? Good lady from District 10. For a question of, with the good gentleman from, for yield. Will the gentleman yield? Gentleman yields. Gentleman yield. Good gentleman. Everything that she said I wouldn't want. Can you, what assurance can you give me that this grant does not allow that? Thank you. A gentleman from four. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and good lady. Uh, this grant is 100% about local control with these local collaboratives. So any curriculum that would be adopted by any groups here, uh, first off, uh, the Association for the Education of Young Children does not have a curriculum, so there's nothing that they could use to push down upon it, these collaboratives. And so these local collaboratives are made up of just what it sounds like, local community. So uh, your community is going to have partners on those collaboratives, and they're going to choose what, uh, what they want to help utilize to, to, to help with their families in those communities. And, and we can't, I have to reiterate it uh, way too many times, but this is not, this is not a, a preschool grant. This is, this is from birth until they get to kindergarten. So, uh, but these local co collaboratives will be the ones uh, determining what, what those support mechanisms and what that curriculum looks like. Not a national organization, not a state organization. Thank you. Is there further debate? A uh, good lady from District 25. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise to talk a little bit about 226 and ask for your support. I, too, have skin in the game and I'm very proud that I was able to stay home with my children, both of them on the ranch. Not saying that my children are going to have the same opportunity, but my job is to look out for the future of Idaho, empower our parents, and find what works. I can tell you that we've got 170,000 families with children between the ages of zero and six in the state of Idaho. We have done an amazing job developing our local economies and bringing in businesses who have little families. I've been working extensively with the Magic Valley Collaborative on really making certain that we're providing our child care institutions and our parents and our families with opportunities to invest in our children. 85% of a child's development happens between the age of zero and three. I think it is important for us to step back and recognize the value of some of these early collaboratives. And while what worked for me, staying home with my children, reading to them, loving on them, getting their boots dirty, eating a little cow manure in the process, 
it worked. I've got two amazing children, but my job is to identify and work with that next generation of working families to find those early childhood programs that work. And again, I've worked very closely with the Magic Valley Collaborative and know that the job that they're doing really is putting resources into the hands of the parents, of the child care providers. We're working very closely with the College of Southern Idaho and our school districts to really find the needs in the community Community to make certain that they've got the skill set that they need to develop our future workforce. I can tell you 226 excites me because we have that opportunity and we have that grant money from the good gentleman who was at the helm of the United States of America back in 2020 issue this grant to the state of Idaho so that we can continue to support our parents, that we can continue to support our families, we can continue to support our child care facilities because what worked for me and my family I hope works for my grandchildren, but that may not be the need that our families need. Our job is to really take care of those 170,000 families across the state of Idaho who really are looking for assistance to help guide them and the support services at the child care level, at the family level, or at the community level. I have no doubt that this will go back into our communities because I am at the table helping them distribute those funds and supporting the next generation of Idaho's workforce. I really ask you to help me support 226. Thank you. Is there further debate? Good lady from District 5. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good ladies and gentlemen. So I, too, was fortunate to stay home with my children because I was a farm and ranch wife. Um, and my kids learned how to pick up rocks when they were really young because that's what we do in Southwick, Idaho. Um, and, and so when my daughter Marie turned three, I was talking to some of my fellow young mothers in the area, and we were concerned that uh, we weren't able to provide our kids with kind of enough uh, playtime and educational opportunities. We didn't want to do childcare, and so we decided to do a cooperative um, um, preschool program. And so eight of us joined together, we teamed up in teams of two, and we each took a day, and three days a week we met and, and had each other's children in this class. I went up to Spokane, I found a book of curriculum, um, so they had little lesson plans, and so we didn't have to think up of the lesson plans. One thing I learned very quickly, I don't ever want to be a teacher. What a hard job those ladies and gentlemen have. Um, and, and so we successfully did that between eight families. And I, I'm really excited that one of these collaboratives is still down in the Kendrick Julieta area. Uh, we taught in the basement of the Methodist Church. Um, we had a lot of support from other people. But we weren't really, we didn't really connect with all of the young parents in the, in the area. And all of those children could have had this opportunity to come. And we could have expanded our ability to provide this opportunity. And I'll never forget my daughter Marie, every time she went, uh, when it was preschool day, she was, yay, friends, because we live 16 miles from Kendrick, another three miles to Julieta. Um, she didn't have any friends where we lived. Um, so when this came up, I, I made several phone calls, and I asked specifically, would we have been able to do this very same program under the Kendrick Julieta model as, as we did back 30, Marie's 34 years old now, would we be able to do this same program now? And I was assured that all they're doing is helping to facilitate that local collaborative effort, that the community determines what curriculum that they want to teach their children, and all they're doing is helping network everybody together. So what that tells me is that if we want to teach um, the Pledge of Allegiance, the Star Spangled Banner, if we want to go up to Spokane and get a curriculum book, or if we want to go someplace else online now and get a curriculum book, those communities can determine for themselves what they want to teach their children. We as parents, for ourselves, can determine what we want to teach our children. But it gives us an opportunity to connect together and create that opportunity for our kids. And for rural Idaho, that's really important. There's a lot of people in my district that live 23 miles from the local 
uh, school district. And if they had an opportunity to do this um, themselves and, and direct what that curriculum looks like, I think they would be very excited about that. And those kids can say, yay, friends. And with that, I hope you give this your green light. <clears throat> Is there further debate? John from 24. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think this is the first time in nine sessions I have to declare rule of 80. So um, I am on the advisory board that the governor created to oversee this grant. So to make that note. Your declaration uh, under rule 80 will be noted in the journal. You have the floor to debate the bill. Yeah. Um, I, I have been on that board and I've attended, I don't know how many, countless meetings, many more than any of us would have liked to. They were almost all Zoom, so I don't have perfect attendance, but I can say that of the questions that were raised that would be of concern to me by the good lady, uh, is it seven? Yes. Yeah, from seven, that not once did I ever hear anything like that ever discussed in any meeting, any direction about what needs to be discussed at, at, in, in the classroom or at, at a preschool level. And um, uh, I, I would have been alarmed if I would have heard most of the terminology that I've heard here today. I, there are a few times I've spoken up and said, are you going too far on a, a few issues? And one of the biggest things that I did was create a questionnaire that they went around the country, around the state, asking preschool and parents, and, and what are you doing and what would you like to try and develop a network and, and help with that? Um, I know that my granddaughters attended uh, the Early Childhood Center in Twin Falls, uh, at, sponsored by the College of Southern Idaho, and they loved it. My, my daughter and her husband loved seeing their kids grow through that. Um, I know I've referred my church preschool and, early, and daycare center to this group to get support and help on how they could do a better job and uh, uh, with that. So, and. A lot of these daycare programs are church-run, and you can imagine in Idaho, most of those are probably Christian churches of one form or another. So um, with that, I just wanted to say that I look at it as been mostly coordination and to make sure you know that I have been on that board. So thank you. Is there further debate? Gentleman from four. Would my seatmate and gentleman from four just yield for a question? The gentleman yield to a quick question. Gentleman yield. Gentleman yields. So appreciating that our former president and our senators have secured money for our kids, I was concerned about some of the testimony, and I would just want to make sure that the, uh, will the Idaho AEYC be, want to make sure, I think I know the answer, but will they not have the hand in providing curriculum? It'll truly be up to the individual local people to do so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and good gentlemen. Uh, yes, so the, the primary focus around uh, this grant is these local education collaboratives and, and largely uh, AEYC will be serving as a, a coordinator essentially of these programs and help provide uh, resources and information to them as needed. Uh, but the local education collaboratives will be, you know, determining what, what, what they have for needs in their community. And, and oftentimes we initially think, well, that, that's a center at a, a, a a church, for example, where kids go. But that may not be the case for all these communities. It may look very different where, uh, as the good lady from Five mentioned, uh, there's, uh, when she was raising her kids, it, it was uh, with several families in the community where they work together. Um, and sometimes it's just helping resources for an individual family uh, that, that may be uh, doing homeschooling completely at that age, uh, but providing the resources for them at, at that level. But, but ultimately, it will be up to the local education collaboratives as far as determining uh, what resources are necessary for those families. Thank you. Is there further debate? Uh, good gentleman from 12. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I should probably declare Rule 80 myself. I've been active with a local organization in our Canyon County called 2C Kids Succeed. I Your declaration hear. will probably be noted in the journal. And if I may continue. You have the floor to debate. Thank you, Mr. And Speaker. And it will be noted in the journal. Thank you. Uh, I just verified that uh, with that local organization that those funds will trickle down to them and local families in the communities. I think what the good ladies from 25 and 5 are speaking to is something that I had the privilege of reading several years ago, and it's called The Principles of Normalcy. And what happens is those folks who are incarcerated, they don't know normal. They weren't raised normal. They weren't raised by a normal family. And that's what 
a lot of these funds go to that level. It needs to start at, the, at those ages to learn normal. And part of our group at 2C uh, Kids Succeed is called ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Traumatic experiences in childhood life that have impact as they become adults. So again, Mr. Speaker, committee, these funds are gonna be used local. I just had the privilege of understanding that. And uh, I think that needs to move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there further debate? Uh, good lady from 31. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, I appreciate a lot of the comments that are being made, but I think in some ways we're missing the point. Um, this organization will receive some fees for administering these grants, and so some of these dollars will go to support this organization and their mission in that sense. The other thing that I think is important to remember is that they will be providing resources and information in an advisory role. So in my mind, until we can answer the question, is this organization credible and are we comfortable with this leadership role for this particular organization, talking about whether preschool is beneficial or not is, is kind of beside the point. So um, with that, I will be voting no. Is there further debate? John from 34. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members of the House. Despite any and all promises that can be made here on the floor today, once enacted, we will not be able to control the content and curriculum that happens in preschool from a grant like this and from extending it for more years. Even if you think we have the choice to choose content and curriculum, the choice will be amongst a group of options that may not be acceptable to us. We don't get to control the options, but we may be able to control the choice of those options, but what if they're all bad options? Look at the problems we have trying to control content, curriculum, and programming at the higher education level. Look at the problems we have trying to control content, curriculum, and what is being taught in our K through 12 schools. We've had Common Core for, tw for 10 years. We were promised we could get rid of it any time we wanted to. We're trying to do it this year. I'm being told that it might take three to five years before we fully do it in Idaho. But then again, that's what I was told five years ago. Can you see the forces lined up against Idaho choosing education for itself and for its preschoolers? Can you see the forces lined up against families and against communities? We think that federal money is, is free, but it's not. It comes with controls. The good gentleman from 24 said uh, that the, the board will make the, de will make the decisions, but then he says they're not discussing anything about content and curriculum. Well, how can we control what is being taught if the board itself is not discussing the content and curriculum? The money is not free. Federal money is some of the most expensive money we decide in here. The control is absolute and the price of freedoms lost is unaffordable. Say no to the justice, say no to social justice being taught in Idaho preschools. A federal grant is the opposite of caring. It goes against families and communities. Families and communities should be deciding the precious education options for our preschoolers and those younger than, uh, than kindergarten. Thank you. Is there further debate? Hearing none, a oh, lady from 33. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I think I might have to declare a rule 79 and a half. Not sure if it's 80, but it's kind of getting there. Um, I, I, on one of my uh, jobs outside of here, I do oversee one of the things I do as a preschool. Um, not sure if we're getting funding from this. But uh, friends, let me just at least share this thought because uh, certainly, yes, I did attend in the summer of uh, 2019 with um, uh, the good gentleman from is it 23. Yes, uh, 24, good gentleman from 24 and others, a um, most interesting uh, conference. And this conference, of course, was in New Orleans, having never been there. I thought that might be an interesting place to visit. Uh, but I, more than anything, I was very curious what uh, these groups and this conference centered on early, um, essentially early childhood education, what sort of conversation we would be having. I, I tried to be open. I did. I've engaged in these conversations to see uh, where and what and how we might be able to truly help those 
who might need that help. Let me share this experience with you because I have to give it pause when in moving forward, and this is why. And this happened more than once. But imagine this. We're at a conference. You guys have been at a conference, and we're sitting with our group. So we have our table over here with Idaho and New York, Pennsylvania. Everybody's sitting around, and we're listening to panelists up there at the front. And these panelists, uh, I believe on this one particular one, were filled with women. Uh, highly educated women, no doubt. Um, I a absolutely appreciate the amount of knowledge that uh, they had. And yet they were discussing the topic of women who were essentially forced to remain home. It was such a catastrophic thing. They were forced to remain home with these kids. I'm, I'm serious. And I turned to our table and I made this comment. I said, you mean mothers? raising their children? Have we gotten to the point that is so denigrating and such um, a hardship for a mother that decides to remain home with her children that we have to disparage that? There is nothing wrong with being a mom at home and it should be something that should be celebrated. And so I do have my own concerns on this. I am happy to try to work and find means by which we might uh, uh, help those who may need help uh, at home, whose parents maybe need some training for their kids and uh, have, have actually been engaged in quite a number of meetings um, um, with um, oh, my, my good friend here and just uh, the upstart, upstart for, as, as one of them. Uh, but but I, I think I, I have concerns let me just share that much with you since, since you do know that I attended uh, the conference. It was the most interesting conference and I would probably have, have to say as being one that's never had children, you know that, um, but I work with children all the time and I love children. Uh, I don't think that for the most part these women and I shared very much in common. But I, um, anyway, I'm going to vote no. Thank you. Is there further debate? Uh, jump from seven. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, just to follow up of what the good lady just was talking about, it, I don't think anybody does a better job than mothers in the home. And any bill that makes it easier or more convenient for mothers to come out of the home and let somebody else raise their child, I, I just don't think that's a good direction for us to be going. Uh, I realize this bill is trying to help, uh, you know, with early childhood care, but are we really hurting the family unit in the process? I just don't think there's anybody better at raising our children than the parents or the mothers. Uh, I, I believe this bill is good-hearted in its nature, but it's going the wrong direction as far as strengthening the family unit. And so, uh, for that reason, I, I can't support it. Is there further debate? Uh, good lady from District 10. Speaker, to debate for the first time in favor. You have the floor. So when I listen to you, it's like, no. But do the good lady from 7. But when you, when I listen, uh, when I take it back, back to the local level, where there are people who I actually know because the good gentleman from 12 brings to mind specific individuals whom I do trust. And as a conservative person, um, I do believe that local control, when, you, when the dollars come from President Trump to, to conservative folks at, uh, at the Senate to give to Idaho to say, we're going to trust you at the local level to put those dollars to good use. And I agree that there's no one better to raise the child than the parent. But sometimes the best efforts of that parent, they need help. And if we can help them in this way with putting it into the hands of people who th that I work with, every day in my community that I know and care about, who share my same values as a Christian and as a, a, a proud American, then 
that I do feel like that I can um, vote with good conscience about this bill in the affirmative. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a further debate? Lady from one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, to debate for the first time. Um, with the body's um, consent, I'd like to just read a short quote. Without objection. Thank you. Lady may read the short quote. It's very short. Um, the quote says, the state must declare the child to be the most precious treasure of the people. As long as government is perceived as working for the benefit of the children, the people will happily endure almost any curtailment of liberty and almost any deprivation. It's Adolf Hitler. That should send chills up your spine. Um, I'd like to go to a conference in New Orleans to study children and how we should fund children and how we can get more children from birth to kindergarten um, help. And then for the legislature to give me $6 million to invest to where I see fit. I think the one thing we're not keeping in mind here is this money is going through one organization. When we pass any bill on the floor, we don't single out certain companies even though some of these bills we pass through kind of help certain companies, we never single out just a specific one person or one group for our money or our bills to go for. And so this, this is putting money, $6 million worth, into one nonprofit. And this nonprofit, whether we want to admit it or not, is connected to the mother nonprofit. Um, the national mother mother nonprofit. Um, I find it interesting how so many people in this body homeschool their kids. It's amazing to me because we all have great ideas on what we should teach our kids and how we should help to teach them and send the grant money. But a lot of us in here are homeschoolers or homeschool their kids or, or in co-ops or private schools. So. Um, some of the big issues I have is the curriculum. And, and if you go through their website of the IAEYC, um, they talk about anti-bias education. It's a worldview where America is systematically and irredemically and, and racist. They're racist. And they believe that activism is central to their mission. And this is what we're going to get to our, our infants and our one-year-olds and our two-year-olds and our three-year-olds. Um, it also teaches that it's not enough for white children to be aware of their complicity in racism. That the, um, it is not enough that white people are aware of their complicity that... Um, I can't read my writing, so I don't know what else is. <laughs> um, Anyway, we're indoctrinating our children at a younger level here. It, it's pretty obvious to me when you look at this curriculum and you look on their website, there's no escaping it. When there's, the books are already written, the curriculum's already written, there's social justice in it, um, this, this is what we're, we are appropriating. We are allowing this by giving $6 million to one nonprofit in our state. And if we're going to be giving money to children, to schools, to indoctrinate, maybe it's time we as a legislator look at reading and writing and arithmetic instead of these social justice issues that we're pushing on our children. Um, there's so many children now that graduate that don't even know if they're a boy or a girl. And we're going to now confuse them more with telling them that they're systematically racist. So um, I, I'm going to encourage you to vote no against this bill for the main reason that we are appropriating $6 million to one nonprofit in this state, and that's unfair. There's, there's probably better ways to get the money to these smaller groups than going through uh, an organization that's connected nationally. Is there further debate? Gentleman from four. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, if the, my seatmate would uh, uh, answer a question, yield to a question. Well, could the gentleman yield? Gentlemen, yield. So this is a tough one, and good lady from seven and the good lady of ten bring up great arguments, and I'm still where I'm needing to get some information from you. Um, 
transparency, selections, things like that. How, what's built into this process for transparency? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good gentleman from four. Uh, several things are, first off, I think uh, we have to be really careful when we're saying we're just gonna give $6 million to this nonprofit. You can read it in this bill. This, this $6 million goes to the Office of the State Board of Education, and then they set up a contract with whoever they want to. Uh, in this case, they've identified, obviously, this particular organization because they've been utilizing their services for the past year, and this organization makes a lot of sense to fulfill those needs. Um, so, so don't get af off into you know, the weeds there thinking that you know, we're, we're giving $6 million uh, straight away to an organization with no strings attached. There certainly will be a contract and oversight. Uh, in addition to that, as far as oversight of financial um, records, et cetera, uh, if you want to look at the previous uh, grant and their, uh, how those monies have been expended, those are on uh, the association's website. You can track down to the, the single dollar and penny if you want to, to see where the, the dollars have been utilized. And also, this is a federal grant, so it has to be audited and reported to the federal government, which it is currently and will be in the future if it's awarded. Uh, is there further debate? Uh, good lady from 31, for what purpose do you rise? Mr. Speaker, to debate the bill for the second time. Does anyone wish to debate the bill for the first time? Good lady from District 11. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to debate against this bill. I will not be supporting it. I'm getting really tired of hearing that the things that we talk about, um, things that are happening with critical race theory and social justice and the transgender stuff and, and the list goes on and on, that that's never going to happen in Idaho. Don't tell me that's not ever going to happen in Idaho. I can already attest to that. My, one of my children, who is in high school, had to write a paper this year, this school year, and he had to show why he was responsible for the black wealth gap. That is what he had to write about. When uh, some of us parents found out about that, we raised a ruckus over that because that was not proper for my, my children, for our children to be learning. He has no skin in that game. He is not responsible for that. We have this organization, the NAYC, I believe, um, NAEYC, and they are a national organization. They are already known for teaching uh, social justice and critical race theory. And just because they are a national organization does not mean that those things do not trickle down to the state level. They take their, if you want to call it orders, at the state level from the national organizations. That is who they go to to get their resources. That is who they go to to find out what they need to be doing uh, with their organization. It's the same with any organization. When you have a national organization, the state organizations that affiliate under those take their marching orders from the national organization. Doesn't matter what it is, it's the same regardless. So when we have a national organization that is utilizing teacher material that is called anti-bias education for young children and ourselves, that is going to trickle down to the state level. Uh, lady 26. I object. Let's debate the bill, not about curriculum, not about national organizations going to the state. Let's debate the bill and not what we perceive is going to happen. Thank you, good lady. Please proceed with your debate, uh, taking into consideration that we need to stay on subject. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So my point being is that you cannot tell me that things will not happen in Idaho because the goals that we are seeing transpire throughout many, many areas and organizations is to create our education system and to take away the local control that we have and to put it into a national socialistic environment. That the money, I don't, it doesn't matter what the amount is, but the money will eventually trickle, as the good lady from 31 said, it will trickle to the national organization. And regardless of if you support or don't support their mission, they will receive money from our state. Um, I think we need to be very, very careful because, as I said, the goal in the long run is to be able to take our children from birth 
and to be able to start indoctrinating them and, and teaching them to be activists and to do the things that, um, that we feel as parents and as people coming from a conservative, conservatively known state um, are inappropriate. So I cannot support this type of measure because regardless of the amount of money, regardless of how many times we're told that this will not happen in Idaho, that we have control over the situation, that I've seen too many times where the opposite occurs. Thank you. Is there further debate for the first time? Good lady from District 14. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the good gentleman from four stand for a question? Will the good gentleman yield? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's starting to feel like uh, Catholic Mass, but happy to, happy to <laughs> respond. Don't go clear to your knees every time. Uh, the gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good gentleman. Um, I'd like to understand a little bit better who is around the table of these community collaboratives. Gentleman from four. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just one second, and I can help you out. Uh, there's a lot, so I'm not sure you want me to go through all of them, but uh, let's, for example, I'll use Coeur d'Alene because that's my uh, home area. Uh, so United, North Idaho United Way uh, Child Care Resource Center at Panhandle Health District, uh, North Idaho College Head Start, Post Falls Chamber of Commerce, CDA Chamber of Commerce, Alliance Data, uh, City of Coeur d'Alene, North Idaho College, is an example, uh, use Magic Valley uh, College of Southern Idaho Early Childhood Ed Program, uh, Twin Falls Library, Head Start, uh, Representative Likely, uh, Twin Falls School District. Um, I can keep Thank going. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, thank you, good gentleman. I think that gives me a good idea. Um, I might just follow up if the good gentleman from forward yield to another question. Well, the gentleman yield to another question. She got me to sit down, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> but yes, I'm happy to yield. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good gentleman. Um, so as you kind of just first start describing some of these um, collaboratives, I am not hearing um, private preschool or daycare providers. Um, is there, in fact, a private preschool or daycare providers on the list? The gentleman from four. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and uh, good lady. Uh, yes, so for example, the American Falls uh, local collaborative has uh, St. John's Preschool uh, and Lighthouse Preschool as two of their collaborative members. Um, keep also in mind that this isn't necessarily uh, only implied to affect um, child care centers. A big part of this grant is to work with families and, and outside of you know, what we would think of as the traditional uh, child care center model. Uh, but yes, there are uh, private um, uh, preschools and child care centers on, in different collaboratives. Thank you. Good gentleman, uh, Mr. Speaker, for a follow-up. Lady from 14. Does the gentleman yield? Gentleman yields. Gentleman yields. Thank you. Don't sit down yet. <laughs> um, so, uh, parents, are there pr parents listed um, or parent organizations listed um, on the provider li or on the collaborative list? Gentleman from four. I, I have a couple individuals, but I don't know that they're probably going to drill down to that level on, on this particular uh, sheet as far as uh, individuals, but you know, on here there's, for example, retired educators is listed in, for the Fremont Collaborative, uh, but uh, I don't know that they probably are more expecting to put individuals down. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, to debate against the bill. Lady from 14 has the floor. Thank you. Um, you know, what I find interesting about this is um, we're talking about communities, and I love the idea of communities coming together to solve problems or to solve challenges. Um, but I, I want those challenges, or I believe that those challenges um, are best met by private solutions and not government solutions. And this sounds like we are engaging in government solving um, problems or challenges. Um, so while I like the idea of communities talking about this, it sounds like this is a grant about talking and not solving. And we know that our problems are best met by um, private, uh, private, the private sector. Um, I also have, let's call it heartburn, but I, I have a problem in that I don't know 
when the role and the responsibilities of the State Board of Education and through what state code or legislation did the State Board of Education become responsible for caring for our birth through age four children. I, I can't find that in code. I don't know what empowers them to do that. Um, but I'm uncomfortable with the idea that we are now, yes, through a grant, a federal grant, but that we are now having the State Board of Education become um, responsible for that age group. So I love the community coming together and addressing and, and thinking about and talking about empowering parents and private individuals and businesses to solve problems or challenges in our community. I am not comfortable with the state board or federal money coming in and taking a government top-down approach to our age zero to four. Make no mistake, I've clarified with our board president that preschool in this context does not mean what we understand preschool to be. It's a play on words. It's not about school. It's responsibility for children that are pre, separate word, and school. And I'm not sure that is the responsibility of our state board presently. With that, I'll be voting against this bill. Is there further debate? Hearing none. Good lady from 31, for what purpose do you rise? Mr. Speaker, to debate the bill a second time. Is there anybody who wishes to debate the bill for the first time? Hearing none, good lady has the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate so many of the things that have been said, and I need to share that there was a large group of us that had the opportunity to speak with Debbie Critchfield about some of these concerns. And in that conversation, there was one piece of it that was especially troubling to me, and I know we've discussed it on the floor today, and um, the things that have been said do not align with her response to our question, and so I wanted you to be aware of that. Um, when asked about oversight for this grant, she indicated that once the grant was given to this organization and then distributed, that there was no further oversight on the part of the State Board of Education. And, um, and I believe that's for the reason that this is a non-governmental organization, and so there's no longer control over what they do with this grant funding. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Thank you. Thank you, good lady. Good lady from 25. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's probably imperative that I declare a Rule 80 and would like to debate uh, very shortly for the second time. Lady has the floor. Being part of the Magic Valley Collaborative, I can tell you we've got several mothers of young children on that collaborative who re represent nobody but themselves. And so I, I ask you to step back and I ask you to think about the future, Idaho's um, literacy, getting our children to read by the uh, third grade. I ask you to think about our future workforce. And again, I was very happy that I was able to stay home with my children. And not everybody makes that decision. And I encourage you to support House Bill 226. Is there further debate for the second time? Hearing none, would the good gentleman for care to close? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good ladies and gentlemen, there's been a lot of debate here. I appreciate it. Um, I think though probably for a lot of it, we were not in left field, but maybe in the back 40, uh, if you will. Um, I, I think there's a lot of things to address here. First off, um, as far as supervision, of this money. Again, look in the bill. This money doesn't go to an organization. This money goes to the Office of the State Board of Education. So they're responsible for the oversight of this. And just with any other agency that, that hires an, uh, an entity or a company to provide uh, fulfillment of some sort of service or product, there's a contract related to that. And they're going to enforce that contract. So it's do not believe for a second that, you know, if this money is appropriated uh, to the Office of the State Board of Education, that they'll have no uh, oversight or authority once, once it's been issued. Um, talked about the transparency. If you want to find out how this money has been spent, you can find it on the uh, website of the I Idaho 
a EYC, excuse me, um, and it's also all uh, audited and reported to the federal government. So if you're concerned about uh, how these dollars will be utilized, I can assure you uh, that those are, those are monitored closely. I also think it's really important we keep going, using going back and forth between the Idaho Association and the National Association. I can 100% guarantee you that there's no dollars that are intermixed between those two organizations. They are two separate 501c3s. None of the dollars that are appropriated from this particular uh, grant will go to the national organization. And those two organizations have very different uh, sets of policies. I also think we're, it's really fun and, and easy to use touch tone touchstone terms in these days day and age. Uh, social justice, white privilege, certainly uh, raises my blood pressure and raises my uh, level of interest, uh, but that's not the purpose of this grant. This grant is about helping families, local families, uh, helping children in Idaho. Uh, none of the curriculum that I've seen associated uh, with anything that the local collaboratives have been working on ever references anything along those lines. This is ultimately left up to our Idaho communities to determine what is necessary and what is best for their uh, children and uh, communities. And also, this is not a referendum on motherhood. I heard many times where individuals uh, indicated that somehow uh, if, a, if a mother has to or chooses to send their children to a, a child care facility, that somehow that makes them less of a mother. Uh, I will tell you I have skin in the game too here. Most of you know I have two, ch two young uh, children. Both of them happen to go to a religious uh, child care facility. Uh, and that's because my wife chooses to work and that she finds value in that. And I don't think that makes her a less of a person. Um, I don't think it makes anybody a less of a person if they choose to stay home with their children. I think that's an excellent opportunity for those individuals. But uh, this is certainly not intended to, you know, direct one way or the other our social values in the state of Idaho. It's about helping children and helping families. And remember, again, this is all about giving parents choice. If they want to participate in these local collaboratives and the, the outcomes that they provide, it's certainly their choice one way or the other. Uh, but it does provide our communities the opportunity uh, to, to work together, to collaborate, to try to help our children be prepared as possible for kindergarten. Um, and with that, I encourage your green light. I think this is a good opportunity for Idaho. I'm, I'm happy that the Trump administration uh, signed off on this, and I'm, I'm happy that our two uh, U.S. senators support this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, gentlemen. You've heard the motion. The question is, shall House Bill 226 pass the House? The clerk will unlock the machine. The member will cast their votes. The clerk will announce the pairs when we get done with the vote. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? The clerk will lock the machine and record the pairs. Bed key votes aye, Crane votes nay, Rubel votes aye, Vishnevsky votes nay, Palmer votes nay, Bundy votes aye. 34 ayes, 36 nays, the majority having voted against House Bill 226. House Bill 226 has failed to pass the House and we follow the Chief Clerk. Good gentleman from 16. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to give notice that I will be uh, moving to reconsider the vote on House Bill 226 and it was on the prevailing side. Notice has been given. Thank you, gentlemen. Without objection, the House will now advance to the 13th order of business. Miscellaneous and unfinished business. We have uh, the, earlier in the day the good gentleman from District 16 under Rule 73 uh, served notice of his intent to move for reconsideration. Gentleman from 16. Mr. Speaker, at this time I move to reconsider House Bill 226. Gentleman from 4. Second the motion, Mr. Speaker. Seconded. Uh, we have a motion that is debatable in, uh, before us. Let me remind the body that we're not going to debate the content of House Bill 226, but we'll debate the merits of reconsidering the, the, uh, the vote and uh, starting the 
debate again uh, in tomorrow's 11th order. So, gentlemen from 16, you have the floor to, de to debate your motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll be quick. Uh, House Bill 226, as we all have just gone through, has received quite some robust debate, and considering how close the vote count is, I think it's worthwhile to reconsider our votes on this important legislation. Is there further debate? A uh, lady from 19. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would just like to share that if we do reconsider and get to a debate, I have some information that I could share at that time um, after having received some of the materials that are used um, in the program that was in question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the way of a point of clarification, point of order, uh, and in with consultation with the majority leader, it would be our intent to take this up today rather than tomorrow while you're all in the mood. His words, not mine. Uh, is, uh, is there further debate? Good lady from District 10. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I am a very much a rule follower, and I, we have, um, I guess I, this is something that you can do, but we already had the vote, and I think that the vote needs to stand. Thank you. Is there further debate on the motion to reconsider? Hearing none, the gentleman has the option of closing debate. Let's do this. Give it a green light. Thank you. Debate is closed. The question before us is whether or not to reconsider House Bill 226. A yes vote will bring it up for debate again, and, and uh, which will proceed to a vote. And uh, no vote would do the opposite. The clerk will unlock the machine and the members will record their votes. <clears throat> Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change his vote? The clerk will lock the machine and record the vote. Were there pairs on this motion? No pairs. <clears throat> the vote count shows 31 in favor of the motion, 37 against, with two absent. The motion has failed. 